They say that life begins at the end of your comfort zone. And for Mercy Kimani, a little bit of faith and a lot of boldness made her move from being a quote-unquote briefcase trainer to owning a training franchise. What does it take to succeed in the world of business? Let's find out. This is She Means Business. I am your host, Claire Munde. Yeah. You have an interesting story of how you ended up starting a franchise uh, yeah. from your background in early childhood education to yes. sign language interpretation. Yeah. But this is She Means Business and I want mm. us to get down to what it takes to own a franchise first of all. Yeah. Now I was going through the page uh, and what it takes to start a franchise and sometimes <laughs> you see you need 500,000 USD, you need this and that. Yeah. So tell us, what does it really take to start a franchise? Ah, thank you, Claire. Yeah, I think uh, when I think of it, I've not thought of it in that sense, but I think for me the fact that it's been done by somebody else, for me that is, gives me hope. And uh, in this case, the franchise we, we run now, I already worked in the franchise for nine years as a trainer. So I had seen the background of it, the behind the scene. I knew the dynamics that make a franchise successful. And it's a business model that I really admired. When I think of uh, entrepreneurship, I think of anything that can give you a system to work in, then allows you not to get burned out. So a franchise is, a, is already set, so it's a plug and play. So it's, it's a model I like. Of course, there are many franchises in restaurants or schools, but I think uh, I'm happy that we got the Del Kanagi franchise and it's, it's a phenomenal opportunity we have to, to grow it and the potential it has, given that we are in 98 countries around the world. There are so many other franchises and many franchise owners who are also there to guide you and tell you, don't go that route, do this. I think for me that community and network of ex other owners, it's, it's amazing because you get into a business by yourself, but not by, but not by yourself. Okay, yeah. I think that's mm -hmm. a good point that you put there. Yeah. It's already plug and play, and mm. you talked about burnout, and we'll speak a little bit about that later. Yeah. But I'd like you to give us a little bit of uh, background because mm -hmm. you uh, were you studied child, early childhood yes. education yes. and you were a sign language interpreter. Tell yes. us what that was like and what made you pivot and decide, you know what, I want to get into training. Great. Yeah, it goes back to when I was in high school and uh, my dad was a doctor and so I wanted to be a doctor until I was in Form 3. And my mom was a teacher. I didn't think of teaching per se, but I think she knew I had it in me to be a teacher and uh, it took time to finally realize, yeah, I think that's what I want to do. So at the point I was uh, going into university, I knew I wanted to work either with very young children or with adults, not a teacher in between there. So I got the opportunity to go to University of Nairobi. I studied early childhood education and nutrition. And for me, that was amazing because it was very much my area of interest. And there were so many opportunities. You could be a teacher, you could be a nutrition expert, you could work in the hospital. So there were many, many opportunities. And so what I did, I took teaching for a while, but it didn't really satisfy my curiosity and need for learning. So when I got at the, I, I had an opportunity to go back to the University of Nairobi, it now opened my eyes even more. That now we had a new field on disability awareness and learning. And I'd always been curious about sign language. So it's something that was right there within me, but I didn't know where to get it. But the fact that I found it and I got in, somebody was going on maternity leave, I relieved her and that way got into it. So I'm still a student, I'm learning, I'm working. It really opened a new world. And looking back, I don't think I did much with the early childhood, per se. The interpreting world was wide open. I did the interpreting specifically in academia and workshops. So it's, it's, a, it's a field that was opening up and uh, being at the university, you're in different classes with different deaf people. So in particular, I worked with one particular staff member who was deaf. And so we had an opportunity to be, I was a personal interpreter. So literally we'd go with her to board meetings, we'd go in with her to class, we'd be in the office. And it gave me a lot of exposure. And when you work with deaf people, you have to be their voice. As much as you sign what they're saying, you have to voice what they're actually say, signing. And so it also develops a lot on your cap capability to be an orator and a communicator and capturing the emotions of somebody else's words. For me, that set a platform that 
made me now go into training with a lot of confidence because you become a quite an effective communicator and a persuasive speaker when you work with the deaf, you know, and the fact that I was also working with a very senior woman, you know, so we were in very high area, I mean, meetings and podiums and you had to come out to really represent her voice and speak. So that laid a foundation that gave me confidence into, into training, but I had never really thought, I saw myself as a teacher maybe, but never as a trainer. But it turned out now that I came into training and I like it. Yeah. Okay, okay, yeah. that's good. Yeah. Now you spoke a little bit about burnout and I'd mm. like us to speak a little bit about that because yeah. sometimes uh, people, women in their careers, they're trying mm. to do this, they're trying to do that and yeah. in the end of it, there's nothing much to show up for it. Yeah. So speak to those women who are trying to maybe start a business or yeah. they're in employment. How do you make sure that you are making the most out of your time yeah. and getting the most out of it? Because as you said, when you were training, yeah. uh, you had burnout and mm. we spoke a little bit earlier. You yeah. talked about raising a family and mm. whatnot and just not it not making sense for you. So mm. speak a little bit about that and how to structure your life yeah. in a way that you get the most out of it. Yeah, yeah. So I think it would be important for anybody to look at their life in seasons and to accept the season you're in. I remember my mom one time told me, if you're a mother with young children, you know, nappy, nappy stage, stay with other mothers at nappy stage because you kind of have things in common, you know. And for me, that has worked. That when I didn't have children, life was different. When you have children, then life is different. Some things must give in for others. And so... I don't think there's really a perfect balance. I think you just put an accelerator on one and you slow the other. So it's like you have that pedal. You know, for now, the next phase, this takes priority, the rest it doesn't. So for every priority you take, then another has to take a behind, you know, a step back. So there were days I was in school, I was doing my degrees or the master's program. So school takes priority. So I may not attend anything on Saturday because class is on Saturday or in the evening. But that's then, and it's for just a year or two. After that, then you take a break, attend all parties, attend all weddings. Then a dark time comes, you have small babies. Like my children, were, they are very close. They were born very close. People thought they were twins. <laughs> and I mean, we had to even get a house manager who is a seventh day because we couldn't carry them to church because then, I mean, you have two, two under twos and it's very tough. So we are made an arrangement, take you off on Saturday, then on Sunday, stay home with the babies, then we go to church. And it worked, you know. So you'll have to be very flexible to accept the faces of life and not fight with it because you, you still get to move on and still get time to do. So I think you look at what you need to do now and not sacrifice for what can't be done later. But all said and done, everything that you need to do, honestly, there'll be time to do it. So yeah. I think don't feel like you're being rushed. That pressure, and sometimes it's just imposed pressure, you don't have to. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I, I like that. Yeah. It's so about I like, juggling, yeah. yeah? Yes, yeah. and also ask, saying, I choose to do this. Yeah. I don't have to, but I choose to do it. Yeah. So I think for I me, that you. language, yeah. language in it helps not get the pressure, like, oh, I have to finish this. Or, but like, no, I don't have to. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and I yeah. think what you've said about even getting the, the house help who could work mm. on Sundays, you need to understand, yes. you don't have to be rigid. Yes. You can move things around to yeah. work in your favor and understand it's for a season and move from that. Yeah. Now, I'd yeah. like us to talk a little bit mm. about communication because that's mm. the field you're in. Yeah. And many times there are people who are trying to scale up in their careers yes. and they are not able to communicate mm. what they want properly and then they end up being underpaid or they're not getting value, mm. Uh, mm. what their value is. So yeah. speak to those women. I really, really value communication. I've seen what it can do when you can't communicate very well. Mm -hmm. And... Just think of it even from a basic level. If you can't just speak, let's assume you are born not able to speak. And that's why those children become violent because there's something about communicating and getting hard. And so if you can't get hard and your story, you can't tell it, then you'll always be represented by somebody else and they may not fully represent you. So what I find is somebody must put effort to learn. You have to be eloquent in the language, whether it's mother tongue or it's English or whatever language. It's good to just be confident in the language, understand it. I think accents or not, those are not important, but just having a command of the language and understanding the culture behind the language. Number two is about learning. I've put intentional effort to go into class to learn. And I remember until I joined El Kanagi, we never used to do rehearsals. You'd just be called to talk and you'd talk. But 
I realized, no, it's actually a skill. You actually have to practice. The way you practice driving and you become a good driver, you have to communicate practically. And I remember back in 2004, when I got the first mentor, and he said, Matthew, if you're going to look for a career in public speaking, you must get two hours a week in front of an audience. And that was a tall order because I didn't think, okay, where will I get an audience? Am I going to start preaching? Or, you know, but he said, you have to get an audience because it's not for them. It's for you to be able to practice. Mm -hmm. And practice makes it permanent. So the more you do it, the better. So if you want to really learn to communicate, learn the basics of it. And I think that's what we do today. In Dale Carnegie, it's all about communication. So you need to learn the structure around communication in different situations. Now, once you get the right structure, then get a good coach. So then you practice. And it may seem a bit weird, but it works. Mm -hmm. It works to know your voice, to, uh, to be confident and comfortable with how you pronounce words and how you see things. And because it's about the mind picture you draw when you speak to people. And clarity comes when your pictures can align faster. Maybe you are too long-winded. You need to be more concise. You need someone to give you that feedback so that you are able to get the message home. You know? But I can tell you, I've watched it and I've seen, I remember like one engineer who came to our program and he said, I have to pay somebody so much money because they are the only ones who can speak about the solution we give. Yet I'm the designer of that solution. I'm the engineer behind it. They said, no, he's holding me ransom. Let me learn to speak for what I do. And so he got empowered. I mean, he now can speak about his programs, his designs. And now he has a technical know-how now plus the communication, bam. It's a win-win, you know? So I think at all levels, even from the time we are children, we need to really, really emphasize that. I, think, I don't think we do it much. We do more of academia, performance in exams, but I think spoken and language is something we have to really put a focus on. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Now let's talk about the challenges of mm. running a business. Um, yeah. There are highs and lows. I'd like you to talk about what are some of the challenges that come with running a business? Yeah, so... I think the first, I started business when I was young because officially I started business when I was still employed around 24 years, but by 27 I had resigned my job to fully go into business. So first is that whole dynamic of knowing what you want to do because you do so many things, you're doing this, you're doing that. So it's like you are a jack of everything and a master of none and you're not sure whether to be a specialist or not or to be a generalist or not. You still haven't gotten your ground on what you're good at. And so that's one big challenge I found. And uh, there's the issues of believing in yourself, you know, because sometimes you're the youngest in the room or you don't look. I mean, how many times I appeared in forums and people say, are you the mercy? Oh, you know, on phone you sounded different. Now they look at you, maybe you're petite or you're smaller than they thought. There's all these other things that could shake your confidence around starting a business. So I think for me, that's a big challenge to, to start. For many people, the ideas are there, but to just start it off is tough. The truth is you will lose money. And I think you just have to allow yourself to lose money. Not foolishly, but just know you have to pay school fees. There's never a free ride. You'll pay for it somehow. So either you'll pay with time or with effort or money. You'll invest and it will not work. Mm -hmm. Or you'll have a, an idea and it won't work. So I think also just that ability to forgive yourself and move on and say, you know what? I learned. There's no failure. I either succeed or I learn a lesson. So the ability to go back and post-mortem and just say, these are the lessons I'm picking and I'll pick myself again and the next phase. And I remember at one point my business just went down like totally. And I sat with a mentor who told me, must remember you are the employee number one. You created it. You can do it again. And I think for me that's the encouragement that no matter what, you are the source of that business. So you're the engine and you're the number one. So you can always start a version two because you're the beginner, you know. So I think unless you stole the idea from somewhere else, if it really was your passion and it was you who began it, there's always that opportunity. And again, some people are never meant to be in business. I think also somebody has just to learn that and agree. Maybe I'm not meant to be in business. And if you are not, it's not, don't feel guilty. I know Kenya, there's that thing. Oh, you don't do anything else on the side. <laughs> I think it's okay to also be fine that I'm not in business and I'm not cut for business because you need to have a, a certain, I could say, or a DNA yeah. <laughs> to be an entrepreneur. Because the risk factor is high mm -hmm. and for some people it's too much. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you have to combine that. You have your own drive, but also you have the support structure around you. And I'm, I'm, I'm forever grateful. From the day one I started business, I had a mentor. Mm -hmm. 
I've always had mentors. So I don't say I'm those people who are self-made, no. I actually tell people I live an assisted life. Like every bit of my life, there's somebody I can tell you, they know that mm -hmm. side of me and they guide me on that. So I think for me that has helped because then you can drive in what you're really good at yeah. because then other people take everything else, you know, yeah. yeah so. I, th I think that's a good point that you put out there that not yeah. everyone is cut for business and the way yeah. <laughs> everyone is like, you're not doing anything else exactly. and that pressure and you go into business and maybe you're not cut out for it. So maybe let's mm. talk a little bit about that. Yeah. We're talking about the DNA of a person who, who <laughs> an fits there an entrepreneur. Yeah. So tell us, what does that look like? How would you mm. know, am I cut out for business or maybe I should just keep that aside? Yeah, I don't think it's something that's black and white. Mm. Per se. Mm. But I think it's just good to know, and I saw it even with my, you can be, let's say, a good doctor, but you can't run a hospital. Mm. You can be a good accountant. Technically, you are qualified, you can keep books, but you can't run an accountancy firm. You see, so just understanding those dynamics, and therefore, the case is the reason you want to do the business. Mm -hmm. I think sometimes people start businesses for the wrong reason. Maybe it's the wrong reason, but even if you started for the wrong reason, get the right reason and mm -hmm. get on track. Mm -hmm. Because then that keeps it. Most people say, I'll start a business for money. Yeah. But I can tell you money comes very fast, faster than you thought. Then what? Mm -hmm. What keeps you there? You see? So, and I think the more I've talked to mentors, the one mentor, she told me, Masi, you need to know what's your business and what's your investment. Mm -hmm. I'd never thought of it like that. Mm -hmm. I said, oh, so there's an investment. She said, yeah. There are things you can start, put money in them, put system, they'll run with or without you. They'll make for you money. But they're not your business. And they're not your passion and they're not, it's just an opportunity. So you had the, 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 the opportunity or you had the language or you, ha you are the right person in the right place and just found you, you know. And so I look at the models we have now. They are really wide. And so if somebody really wants to go into business, I think they can look at many models where you don't have to be the one to do everything. You can partner with other people. You can be a shareholder. You can just have a component of the business that's just what you're good at. But I mean, you can just decide. Yesterday I spoke to somebody who told me, I said, oh, I've lived a soft life in my career. I've held a job for over, four, I mean, 20 years. Mm -hmm. I've had a stable salary, and every year I graduated in my job. I don't want to start a business, then I start hustling. Mm -hmm. She told me that, and I said, I think it's good to know that you don't want to hustle. Mm -hmm. And you don't have to. You can put structures, you can run things, you can have some buffer, so that it doesn't have to be too hard. But the reality is, there's a form, even the ones who are fully funded, you may not struggle with finances or money, but you may struggle with other things, you know. And so for me, the grit of an entrepreneur, that thing that still tells you go ahead, do it, try again. I think for me, that's where the, the, the vibe comes in. And so I think now there are many definitions around a business owner, a self-employee, an entrepreneur. I think just understanding where do you want to come into. But I think we start somewhere. Yeah. So... For me, because my parents went into business, they left employment when I was in primary school. I, I was home. I saw them leave. They really thrived in business. They always told us, you have to, st I mean, this is the way to go. Mm -hmm. It will be good. So I think there was that. And sometimes it happens that you come from a background of people who encourage you to go into business. Other backgrounds, they will tell you, don't. Nobody ever in our family went into business. So mm -hmm. you may struggle more than the person who has a whole family rallying for them and supporting them than the person who... Nobody even wants to know you're in business because they feel it's an embarrassment. Why did you leave that big job? Mm. So those things work. And I think everybody has their journey. But bottom line, I think we have to really do what you want to do. Mm. And if you fail, then have a plan B. Mm. I think there's always a plan B mm. and a C and a D. And I always say, you can always get employed again. Mm. You can always move towns. You can, so don't feel stuck. If it never worked, find new land. You know, you learn. But I think for me, I'm not cut for the comfort of security and sit there and let things mellow. Mm -hmm. I feel when things are mellowing, they are going down. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. So I'm not saying you always be on the run, but yeah. it's always knowing there's the purpose you came to the world to do. Mm -hmm. So, so long as your purpose is not achieved, then you have to be working on your purpose mm -hmm. and carry your load well. I also feel sometimes people struggle in business because they carry the load the wrong way. Because imagine you have a baby, a one-year-old baby or seven-month-old baby to carry, and you carry them on your back. You can carry them for a whole three kilometers. But if you carry them with your hand, they are heavy, they'll weigh you down. So sometimes I feel sometimes how people get into business, the load is correct, but they carry it the wrong way. Mm. So you don't get support, sufficient support. You don't 
measure the correct parameters, yeah. and therefore things just go wrong just because you didn't get guidance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I've looked back at my journey in business and I thank God there were mentors who said, don't buy a car, buy this. Mm -hmm. It's not your time to do this. Don't move out of that house. Yeah. I stayed in a one bedroom for four years and I was earning way, way more than that. And I felt oh, I should change my lifestyle. But they were like, no, you don't need to. Yeah. Because why? Yeah. Why do you want to have overheads that yeah. are not necessary? You get, and people would ask, you're earning so much, why are you staying in such a place? Yeah. You get, so you have to have that confidence to not worry what people yeah. say and what they push, because sometimes people push you yeah. for what you are not ready for. Exactly. You know, so, yeah. I like that. I like mm. carry your load well, yeah? You yes. might be having the right load, but you're carrying it the wrong, the wrong way. So it feels suffering. heavier yeah. than necessary. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yes. So let's talk a little bit mm. more about um, your loads. You've talked about mm. you should be ready to lose money when you're doing yeah. business and whatnot. Yeah. Tell us what have been your loads, and then we'll also talk about the highs in this yeah. journey. Yeah, so I think uh, when I look at my business, in 2007, I registered BMAC consults. It was more for the interpreting work. I used to do a lot of workshop support. I used to do training. But it was a one-man show. So like I was a briefcase consultant. So I would do my work. So I was more of a self-employed. I actually just left a job, but I got self-employed. Mm -hmm. And I employed myself well. I paid myself better than my <laughs> former mm -hmm. job. But the reality is some days work would be a lot. So it's like you have this pendulum. You have work, you're paid, you have checks in your handbag. Yeah. You've not even gotten somebody to take them to the bank. Mm -hmm. Then you're broke, there's no money. Then you have to remember, oh, let me get some time and run to the bank. Then there's a whole season, there's no work. Mm -hmm. Now you're looking for work, but you're at zero. So you had those, you know, ups and downs. And so by 2012, because when I got the first baby, I realized no. So I had time. I mean, for this baby, I planned and I had, I knew my business is me. When I go on maternity, it will go with me. There'll be no, because it's you who goes to work. Yeah. And I remember going to maternity, but I had planned, I had saved for a whole year. So I had a whole year worth of income mm. to take care of the baby. So I was happy, and, but I was also one year with no income because mm. there was no way to go to work. And so either leave the baby or go to work. Mm. So that for me was not a good model. Because I said, I don't want a model where if I get sick, the business gets mm. sick. If I go for a holiday, the business takes a holiday also. So how can I put structures? And in a training business, it's difficult because you're the one they look at. So I started hunger, a hunger for something more than me. Mm -hmm. And I started looking out. But more so, now when I got the second baby who came just after that, now it was tougher mm. because you're thinking, okay, <laughs> now this one was this way, they were sleeping this six hours a day, I would run out. This other one is awake the whole morning, the whole night they didn't sleep. And so the dynamics of work now change. And so I had to pivot again and say, in this phase of my life, what do I want? And said, I want to start a business that can scale. And I actually started a distribution business for food. Because I'd worked with farmers over 15 years. I'd trained farmers on organic farming. So I now did the whole value chain. And I started a distribution business that didn't depend on me mm -hmm. to be there. And uh, we started Chakula. And Chakula kicked off. And I buried BMAC. Mm -hmm. In a way, I said, you know what? This will come again another time. But uh, thank God again for a program I attended. And I always tell him, please attend program. Don't say you've gone enough. Mm -hmm. Because this program came, it was, I think it was a World Bank funded program or IFC. But we didn't qualify to attend. The threshold, they wanted one of those women with high turnovers. But at, somehow, at the end of that project, they called out in the newspapers. It was called GOWI, the Goal Oriented Women Enterprise. And I went to GOWI and it was amazing. Because for the first time, somebody told me, Masi, you're not crazy. All these things you start, they have a, there's a rhythm to it. I'd never sat in an entrepreneur class to just understand, oh, why do I have all these ideas? Why don't I finish what I start? Mm -hmm. And now the DNA of an entrepreneur has been explained to us. Mm -hmm. And they said, oh, you have, you have this idea to start a daycare and this food thing and this training. What's the common thread? You know, and so putting everything now within a system, for me that worked. I'd never done a strategy for my business. There was no strategy, there was no plan, there was no vision or mission or anything. Mm -hmm. So I realized, hmm, there's more to this whole journey. It's not that I'm making more than my salary. That, that benchmark is over now. Yeah. There's more to it, and there's impact, and there's profit, and there's growth, there's scaling. Mm. Oh my goodness, now I became super excited. And now entrepreneurship took another turn. And so structuring the business, Chakula was begun with a very good structure, with a name, with an exit. I knew this business, I can sell it. I'll get investors to invest it. I mean, it was a very different business altogether than BMAC, you know. Mm -hmm. But then now also now getting the system because it was still the same 2013 that I actually approached an investor 
and I told them, can we buy a franchise? Mm -hmm. I know I don't have the budget, but I'll train in it, you buy it. I will make sure it runs, you know? Mm -hmm. And that's the partnership we got in. So I came in as a trainer, training partner. He came in as a owner. Mm -hmm. So he bought the franchise, he had the, he had the money. For sure, franchises are expensive. Yeah. So he had the budget. But I also thought it was a very good experience because now I drove it. Mm -hmm. So I knew everything. I, I understood what it took to, to be a trainer in the franchise, to be certified. And it was amazing to see that a client didn't have to say must come or don't come because we are all on the same standard. Mm -hmm. And that for me was a, a big, big, big answer to prayer and maybe concern because I'd watched my dad run a business that he was a self-employee. Mm -hmm. And the day he passed away, the business died with him. Mm -hmm. And it was a big business, like it, he had employed 38 people. Mm -hmm. So I always thought, hmm, I don't think I like that. Yeah. I don't think I like that if I die today, 38 families have no food. Yeah. His family, he took care of us really well. We still benefit from his hard work. Mm -hmm. But I look at all the families we had to let go, all the employees we had to let go. And he owned the building where the business was. So, But I, I always say, how many more have to go because the owner died or the owner left? So I think for me, I take the responsibility of an entrepreneur. I feel we should have more ownership to the impact in the community, whereby I hope there was one day we'll get a system to hold entrepreneurs accountable, maybe to, sus to more sustainability-focused businesses. But I, if I go, my business becomes bigger than me. Mm. I look at Dale Carnegie, it's 114 years this year. I mean, he died many years ago. The wife is still alive. But she put a system that will outlive her, her children, her grandchildren, her great-grandchildren. And so there's confidence in knowing that this business will be here for another 200 years. But the owner left, you get. So I think for me, that's the revelation that I look at. And with that understanding, I know now we can run businesses that can outlive us. And we don't need to be there long. I think a business, you need to be there maybe 10 years max. Mm -hmm. Then it kicks off. Businesses, I say, they're like babies. They grow. Mm -hmm. They grow, they walk, they run, they leave you. And they become bigger than you, you know. So if you look at our businesses with that angle that this business will be bigger than me. I'm the one who is the motor one. I'm the one who will die and be buried. This business will not. Then we look at a business with that angle and we detach. And sometimes we are too attached. The business is me and I'm the business. So I think we have to detach so that the business can get a life. Of, because businesses are bigger. If you carry your business too long, it will kill you. Because it's growing heavier every day. Because you're putting system structures in it. So it needs to leave you. You need to let it go. And maybe go get, give birth to another one and let it grow. And I mean, you can keep doing that. Yeah. Or sell it at a point it can benefit other people. I feel we should not let a business just die mm -hmm. and then fire employees, the vision is over. I think for me that's, if I'm asked what a, a, I mean, a reality I would like to see one day, that would be a prayer come true, that we can have scalable businesses in Kenya and stable ones that can outlive us. So mm. as we come to a close, yeah. what is that thing, one thing that you'd like to leave with the women watching, yeah. and even men watching, yeah. uh, on how to just scale their careers and just mm. uh, be the best version of themselves that they can be? Yeah, I mean, it's a big question. <laughs> yeah, but I think we have to know you came to the world for a reason. Honestly, it doesn't matter how you came, you landed and you're here. The reason you didn't die at birth or at childhood or that accident, there's a reason you've not gone. And I think for me, we need to get that. We really need to pin it down and say, history will know me for this one thing. And even if it meant it's the hello I said in the morning to that watchman when I came in, let it be there's a reason I lived today. You see, and let's live life not like living dead. Don't live like you're living for tomorrow or for next month or when I become or when I'll have a baby or when I'll have... No, 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 no. It's for today. And I think for me, the gift of being present in whatever thing you're doing, just be present, like be there. Whether you're selling something, you're cooking, watch that milk coming up on the sufuria. Don't just be, you know, di <laughs> distracted, diverted. Look at people when you're talking to them. Look at their face, their mouth, like be there. I think for me, that is what I would tell women. Because it's all there. Whatever you're looking for, honestly, it's there where you are. So we go very far to look for things, yet we left them where we are because we were not cognizant or aware that they are there. So don't take anything for granted at all. Leave it full, like leave it full and forget yesterday. I think for many years I carried 
weights of the past. But we have to let go. We have to say there's a reason the past is the past and you can't go back. Life has that ability. Even if a baby is born now, and you, they can't go back. So the truth is you can't go back. So you can't do it. So leave it. Tomorrow, if it comes, voila. So I look at my entrepreneurship and I have not put an alarm since I resigned my job, literally. Mm. I wake up with like, wow, mm. let's get going, you know? Because we didn't finish what we were doing yesterday, but the truth is there's a gift for today. And you've been graced that life to live today. For me, don't take a gift and throw it in the dustbin like, ah, it's a, it's a bad day. For me, there's never a bad day. Let's be present, know where you're there, impact everyone. Whether it's a child, a house girl, a boss, a neighbor, anyone. Just know you are a dynamite. There is a reason. I mean, you, you are not dead. You, you have a, f a, a living vibration that anybody you touch, that live wire is there. So that you don't have to wait for that big ceremony. No, you can start where you are. And as you go on up to whenever, we don't know how long, then you'll have lived full. So I'll take those words from a guy called Les Brown. He said, live full die empty, you know? And so for me, that's what I would live. And there are also words my dad told me. I saw my dad to his last days. And at some point, you were very sad. And saying, why do you want me to continue living? What have I not done? What else do I need to do when I've done what I was supposed to do? Mm -hmm. He had a checklist of like five things the last week of his death. And he said, we've ticked all the five. They are done. So I think I've done my part. Mm -hmm. And it's my time to move. So. Let's also be that way, that when it's your time to go, you'll be happy for what you did. And whoever will be left, if they ever look back, they'll find what you left and your footprints continues. Because I don't think we ever go, so long as we left a print on the world and in people's hearts, we never really go. It's only that we transition, but our impact remains. Yeah, thank you. Awesome. <laughs> thank awesome. you. Thank you. <laughs> You've heard it from Mercy. <laughs> Be present, live full, and die empty, and carry your load well. This has been She Means Business, and I have been your host, Claire Munde. Have a good one. To watch this story and more, download the Citizen Digital app today.